Huebner's book, The Blue Zones, became a New York Times bestseller and is endorsed by heavy hitters like Dr. Oz, Oprah, and CNN's Sanjay Gupta. In the book, Dan and his team of researchers, they travel the globe searching for the longest living and healthiest people on the planet. And this afternoon, we're going to travel with them and learn secrets that can help us live long and healthy, too. Now, one of the questions I get is, Doc, how come they're called the blue zones? How come they're not called the green zones, maybe like the green earth movement, or maybe, how about the, the white zones, or, or something else, the red zones? Um, well, it turns out the reason they're called the blue zones is because the team went all around the world studying who lives the longest. And, what, and uh, what they did was they studied centenarians. A centenarian is someone who lives to 100 or more. If you reach 100, you're in the club of centenarian. That's why it's a, a cent. A penny is one one hundred. So a centenarian, uh, they, they look for <coughs> concentrations of centenarians. And they found four areas around the world that have lots of centenarians. So uh, after they got all their research uh, gathering, and they came back into their room, and they had a big table, and they had a map up on the wall, and they were going to, you know, collate all the data, right? So find out where are these centenarians. And the guy that they assigned, the researcher they assigned to mark the map, he happened to pick up a blue pen. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the name Blue Zones, because he happened to pick up... Now that, that's pretty uh, coincidental, uh, it would seem pretty random, but actually... <laughs> After I read the book, I thought about it, and I thought, you know what, that's not totally coincidence. That uh, could be serendipity, friends. Because what comes to mind when you think of blue or true blue? Like, you know, that Chuck, <laughs> he's a true blue friend. What, what do we mean by that? Yeah, yeah. He's going to stick with you, right? Faithful, right? Uh, going to be lo loyal to you, right? Devoted. And that's what we think of blue. That's why IBM, big blue, right? Uh, you can wear any suit as long as it's blue. <laughs> that's what they said. Okay? The blue, true blue, faithfulness, devotion, and loyalty, friends. And I'm going to tell you that is the secret. When we get to the end of this, you're going to find out that that is the secret recipe for the blue zone. Now, where are the blue zones? There are four of them around the world. The first one is in Central America. In Costa Rica, there is a peninsula called Nicoya. And they study the Nicoya natives there, the native Nicoyans. They're what we might call Indians or the native people. Um, one in Europe, Sardinia, Italy. Okay, and then Asia, Okinawa, Japan. And then the fourth one is in the USA, friends. Loma Linda, California. USA, USA, right? All right, so let's study this. Uh, now, in preparation for our flight, please put your seat backs and tray tables in the bright and locked position. And turn off all portable electronic distractions, including mobile phones. Okay, get them out. Get them out and put them on silent mode or turn them off. If you don't know how, turn to your neighbor and they can help you silence your phone because we don't want any distractions during our program. It is being filmed. Okay. Our first destination, Nicoya, Costa Rica. Now this peninsula on the west coast of the country is home to the Nicoya natives. Now this is not just normal Costa Ricans. Like, uh, I, I might decide to retire because of Obamacare. I mean, in spite of Obamacare. Uh, I might retire and go to Costa Rica. Um, they wouldn't study me. See, because I'm not native Costa Rica, but they study the natives there, which are genetically, they've been inbred for a long time, right? For hundreds of years. And they studied those people. Let's see what the team learned about them. First of all, they have faith. They're predominantly Catholic because of the uh, colonial days, you know? This was uh, conquered by Spain. Spain. Uh, so they have faith Catholic, and you'll find that all of the Blue Zones have some type of a faith. Uh, exercise, intense daily exercise. Um, they farm, garden, do all kinds of manual labor. They have sunshine, plenty of it, all year long. They have no summer and winter like we do here. Uh, why? Because they're on their latitude, it's basically wet season or dry season. You know, if you've ever been to the uh, Caribbean, you go down far to the south enough, um, the way you decide when to go is, not should you pack your winter clothes or not, 
it's uh, should you bring an umbrella or not. The temperature, like uh, it, it might the, the in the winter, the highs might be uh, 70, and then and then in the in the summer it might be 80 <laughs> highs. Okay, that's all that fluctuates. We don't they don't have wild fluctuations like we do here. Uh, sunshine all year long. Uh, water, the highest calcium content in all of Costa Rica. Costa Rica itself has a lot of mineral in their water already, but Nicoya has the highest among all the Costa Rican areas. So they thought maybe the minerals in there are helping people live long. Now, uh, another thing they have is their diet consists of a staple of beans, squash, and corn tortillas. Right? And these beans, do you think that these are beans, bushes, uh, beans in a can? <laughs> no, these are fresh beans that they pick. Uh, squash. These are squash from their garden that grandma might have picked, right? Corn tortillas. Do you think they went to uh, Kroger or, or uh, Piggly Wiggly or somewhere and got uh, a dozen in a plastic bag in the frozen section? No. Uh, with preservative in it? No, these, they, these, they had ground the corn meal the night before. Wow, making me hungry already. And I already ate lunch. Now, because of their latitude, they have fruit consumption all year long. Why? Because they have no winter. See, we, we plant a crop in the spring, and then we harvest in the fall, and then we quit, right, for the winter. Then, they have multiple crops all year long, because they have spring, summer all year long. Now, their elders, they live with their families. Um, this is because, you see, they're not, they're not a rich country. So, they don't have um, lots of Nursing homes like we do here, and uh, you know, I go to nursing homes. We have several uh, hundreds of nursing home patients, and <coughs> friends, it costs a hundred thousand dollars per person per year to keep them in the nursing home. That doesn't include when they go out for, to the hospital for pneumonia or heart attack or stroke. Twenty-five thousand dollars extra, ka-ching, ka-ching, right? A hundred thousand dollars per person per year just to keep them in there. They don't have that kind of money. So, oh, grandma has to live with the family. And do you think that that might have something to do with how long they live, yeah. friends? Yeah. Absolutely. Because let me tell you, in our business, uh, if, if they're not demented before they got to the in a nursing home, staring at a white ceiling or a white wall all day long, you're going to be demented pretty soon, right? Hearing the noise from the hallway, beep, beep, beep. Friends, grandma or great grandma or great great grandma, she may not be able to do everything she used to do, right? But she could maybe go and harvest some squash for supper, right? She could maybe grind some corn for the corn tortillas, right? Uh, she could help watch the kids, the grandkids and the great great grandkids. You think that might give them some purpose? Absolutely, absolutely, friends. No man's an island, and we weren't designed to be split up like this. We were designed to all be together. Now, interestingly, they found out that the they surveyed the men, and over 70% of them admit to having cheated on their wives. These are the ones that just admit it, okay? <laughs> and no man would lie about that, right? So we know that the real number is at least 70% have cheated on their wives, okay? Now, uh, I looked at that and thought, Hmm, could adultery be a longevity factor? My wife said it would shorten a man's life, and I believe her, friends. <laughs> the next blue zone, okay, moving over to Europe. Sardinia, Italy. Now, this uh, island off the west coast of the country is home to the Sardinia natives, and that's who they study. Now, uh, you all remember from your uh, high school ge ge geography, Italy is like a boot, right? It's like a boot, and it's kicking the football here which is uh, Sicily, but uh, here is Sardinia. It's at the knee level. So you might think it's kneeing that uh, football. So they studied the Sardinian natives who, they, their history goes all the way back to the Bronze Age, friend. Think Alexander the Great. We're talking 300 BC. So 2000, over 2,000 years. These were a rough bunch of people. And uh, now, some of you who know your history, what empire conquered Greece? 
when the Sardinians, um, when Rome conquered, they colonized the, the coastline of Sardinia. But Sardinia is a very mountainous, it's, I think it's volcanic, it's a mountainous uh, island. So the Sardinians, they moved up into the mountains and then they, they would come down and raid the coast, maybe at night, and then come back up to their mountain hideaways. Well, the Romans got mad, they started chasing them up. Eventually, they chased them up so high they, that the Sardinians hold themselves way up, inaccessible, into the mountains, and for thousands of years, inbred. So we're talking about a very genetically homogeneous group of people. And uh, they are very inbred there, and they study those people because they seem to live very, very long. Let's see what the team learned about the Sardinians. First of all, just because of their topography, they live in a mountainous villages. That means that they have to walk everywhere they go, right? So basically, they're walking up and down the mountains, uh, shepherding, whatever they do, and they're basically doing stair climber all day long, right? Uh, celebrate old people. They also celebrate old people. Uh, they feel that they're special, right? Uh, very unlike, there's there are many things we can learn in America from these cultures, right? They also have a cheese, a special cheese called pecorino cheese. Now, this is a, a special cheese that they get from special milk, that they get from special sheep, that they get, that eat special grass, uh, and that is super high in uh, CLA, which is conjugated linoleic acid. Okay? It's an omega-6, omega-3 type thing. You've heard that omegas are good for you. And this uh, cheese has very high levels of omega uh, fats in it. So they thought maybe that's helping, right? Now, just in case there are some cheese lovers uh, out here, um, you need to be, be careful because this pecorino cheese, they do make a special dish called kazumarsu in uh, Sardinia. And this, they intentionally introduce live fly maggots into the cheese. And the maggots, I'm glad, uh, did, is anyone still eating lunch? Okay, good, everyone's finished. Everyone's finished. Just checking. Uh, they in, let, introduce live fly maggots into the cheese, and the maggots, they eat it, but see, their digestive systems are immature, so they, it's partially digested, their waste products, and it, they, they have a gooey waste products. And so this dish is a gooey cheese dish, and let me tell you, some of the Sardinians pick out the ma live maggots before they eat kazumatsu, and others, I'll leave it to your imagination, my friends. But it's dangerous. The people have died because the maggots have burrowed into their intestines. Just a warning to you cheese lovers in case there's some that might want to go crazy on pecorino cheese. Okay? Now, they also have a wine called Kenanao wine. Now, this Kenanao wine has gotten... It's a red wine. How many of you heard red wine's good for you? Right? Red wine's good for your heart? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's right, that's right. I hear that. So, uh, yeah. So, uh... I would never tell someone who's not drinking wine to start drinking wine, red wine. The red grape juice is just as good. In fact, it's even better. It's even better, okay? Uh, because it doesn't have the, uh, the alcohol in it, see? Why, are, why do we drink red wine? Why are we told to drink red wine? Because of the antioxidants, right? Resveratrol is the one, but... Uh, why, why do we tell them to drink that? Because the resveratrol antioxidant is supposed to be an anti it's supposed to help you, right? Now, um, the res if you're going to take in an antioxidant because you want to do antioxidant to it, but unfortunately, alcohol is an oxidant. Alcohol is not an antioxidant, it's an oxidant. So now, see, you're neutralizing it, right? Why not just take uh, Welch's red grape juice? You get none of the downside and you only get, you get all of the upside. See? Now, um, Cannonell wine is gotten from Cannonell grapes, <laughs> which is a red grape, which is indigent to that area, that island. And uh, they found that it has five to ten times more antioxidants. So they thought maybe uh, them drinking that, that helps them live longer. Because it has so much of the antioxidant, like their resveratrol. But their longevity is rapidly disappearing, friends. They have changed their lifestyle from mount, uh, stair climbing to now they have a sedentary lifestyle because, you know, first world conveniences have come in and they're changing their diet. Right? Now... Here's a picture of Anna, she's 17, and here's her great-grandmother, 97-year-old great-grandmother. Isn't that sweet? I hope Anna lives as long as her great-grandmother. Now here's a picture of her on the town with her girlfriend, and what is that she's got in her mouth? Fried potatoes? 
I'm afraid Anna won't be living as long as great-grandmother. Okay? Changing diet, sedentary lifestyle. Now, the third blue zone, Asia. Okinawa, Japan. This island on the southern tip of Japan is home to the Okinawans. Now, uh, you know that uh, Japan, the whole thing is an island, right? You know that it's an island. Uh, anyway, it's kind of like uh, the Florida Keys. The Florida Keys, you know that they have the uh, oversea highway? You go all the way down to Key West. Well, Key West is what Okinawa would be because once you're at Okinawa, that's the end of Japan. There's no, if you go past Okinawa, uh, Okinawa, you're outside of Japan now. So Okinawa is home to a very interesting people. They're, they're the Okinawans. They don't even call themselves Japanese. See, they say that we're not Japanese. We, are, we have our own language. We have our own culture. We have our own religion. We were just taken in as a prefecture. You know? Just like, uh, let's say, some of you live in Madison, uh, Tennessee, or, or, her, or uh, Donaldson, before it got swallowed up by Metro Nashville. <laughs> See, it used, used to be your own, your own city, right? Now it's not. It's Nashville now, right? It's part of Nashville. Just like that, uh, they just Japan just took it as a prefector. Let's see what the team learned about this uh, group of people that are homogeneous as well. First of all, their diet is low in caloric density. Now, what does that mean? Americans, uh, in America, we don't really usually think about this, so I'm going to illustrate it. A 100 calorie example for calorie density. Each one of these is 100 calories. One tablespoon of any kind of oil, whether it's corn oil, soybean oil, peanut oil, uh, canola, olive, um, lard, Crisco, uh, dressing that is oil, uh, any of those, one tablespoon is 100 calories. Okay? That is the equivalent of one and a half whole oranges. Okay? Now, which of the two do you think is going to make you more full? The oranges, right? It takes up more bulk in your stomach. But they're both 100 calories. Now, that's equal to uh, one, two, three, four cups of cooked broccoli. Which are the Okinawans eating? Over here. Low calorie density, which means you get, you, you get a volume of food, but it packs very few calories. Right? On the other hand, in America, we specialize in packing as many calories into a small amount of food <laughs> as possible. I mean, it's almost to the point of, how do they do that? How do they pack so much in there? Right? Here's another example, which might be more uh, familiar. 490 calories is one order of Biggie's fry. Okay, one order of Biggie's fry. Now, what are what are fries made of? Oh, oil, oil. potatoes, right? And in that order, it happens to be in that order because it's more oil than potatoes. Okay, why? Because over half the calories are from the the grease. Now, uh, one order of Biggie's fry is 490, and they're, they're potatoes. And boy, you know, potatoes are bad for you, right? Potatoes are very fattening. Um, I'm going to just, sh I'm going to show you just how fattening potatoes are. That's the equivalent of one medium Idaho baked potato with the skin on, two of those, three of those, four of those, four and a half medium Idaho baked potatoes. Now, we're not talking about the Cracker Barrel, you know, monsters. We're just talking about medium Idaho baked potatoes. Now, let's, let's just do an experiment because we want to show just how bad potatoes are for you. Okay. Um, let's say, Dr. Yim, you say, Dr. Yim, I'm so excited about this new diet. You know, I learned about God's health plan in the morning, and then now, you know, the, the blue zones. And I, I, want to, I want to be in the blue zone. I want to make my life a blue zone. Uh, and so, say, Dr. Yim, I'm going to take you out to lunch. Let's go to Cracker Barrel. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, we go over there, and then let's say they have a pota baked potato bar. And so the rule is, uh, we, Dr. Yim says you can only eat baked potatoes, but you can't put any fat on them. That's the rule, because we're trying to show you just how bad potatoes are, right? So you can't put cheese, sour cream, butter. Uh, now, I'm not saying you, you cannot eat potatoes that way. We're just making an illustration. But you can load it up with chives, right? cooked onions, mushroom, broccoli, steamed, uh, steamed broccoli. Load it up, salt, pepper. Whatever you like, uh, Mrs. Dash, just load the thing up as high as you want. How many of those loaded baked potatoes could you eat at your lunch with me while I'm going over the diet with you? 
and uh, drink water on the side, right? Because we're just trying to show you how, how bad the potatoes are. Who to buy one? Who to buy one? One, who to buy? We got one. Who to buy two? Got one. Who to buy two? Two. Two. Who, who, who got two? Who to buy two? Who to buy three? Who to buy three? Three, three. Okay, we've got three, three loaded baked potatoes. Who to buy four? Okay, I'm going to force you to eat four of them. What? Four loaded baked potatoes for lunch, and that's all we're going to eat, and with water on the side. You just ate less than the one baby fry, right? And calorically, right? Now, um, let's not go there, huh? You just told me that you could, you, you'd be begging me, Dr. Ian, no more, please, no more. Okay, over at the, the baked potato bar. Now, let, let's not go there. Let's say you take, decide to take me to Wendy's. You know just as well as I do, while we're sitting there eating the 490 calorie fries, we are looking for the 600 calorie burger and the 250 Coke. Agree? Why is that? You just told me that four baked potatoes, pure potatoes, your stuff, and you haven't even gotten to 490. And here at Wendy's, you're not satisfied with just the fries. See? You need a 1,200 calorie meal. Why is that? It's not the potatoes, friends. It's the grease. It's the grease. Let me tell you, the, the poor people in Ireland during the war, they sent all the good food, quote, good food, the meat, the jerky, all that stuff, to the front lines, to the boys fighting. Right? During World War One, So all the people could eat were potatoes. Because you know that's what Ireland's famous for, right? During the four years of the war, heart, heart attack rates plummeted. Wow. Then that, when the boys all came home after the war, yay, hey, we beat Germany. Because <laughs> you know, Germany was behind every, every major war. Right? We all knew that. Historically. <laughs> Even all the way back to Roman Empire, all, all, the, all the vandals and also does, they're from, they're from Germany. Now, we're not saying anything bad about modern day Germans, right? But uh, just, we're just talking about history. So, uh, where, where were we? <laughs> oh yeah, the Ireland, Ireland. Okay, so after the war, heart attack rates went right back up to where they were. Friends. If you're eating pure potatoes and that's all you can eat, my uncles, <laughs> they hate potatoes now because they're so poor in Korea, that's all they eat was potatoes. Potatoes and vegetables. They were healthy then. Uh, now they, had diabetes, they have diabetes. Um, so, why is that? It's not the potato. And sweet potatoes are way better than white potatoes. Um, in fact, sweet potatoes are very good for diabetics. Very good for diabetics. So let, let me tell you, friends, Caloric density is key. That's how these healthy areas are, they're not counting calories. Most of them don't even know what calories are. They would say, who is she? Uh, they, they just eat until they're full because the fiber in the food automatically, automatically shuts off their appetite. Now, they also eat eight times more tofu than Americans. What is tofu made out of? Soybeans, right? So they're eating a lot of soybeans. Now, some people say, well, soybeans, Dr. Hume's breast cancer. That cancer, oh, my cancer is. Funny how the, uh, the ones who eat a lot of tofu, they have lower breast cancer until they move to L.A. or Hawaii, and they've studied the Japanese that moved there. And within 25 years, their breast cancer risk is the same as their neighbors if they adopted the uh, westernized diet. Same genes, friends. We haven't changed genes out. Uh, they're the same genetic... If they had maintained their, Jap their Okinawan or Japanese diet, their breast cancer risk is the same as their relatives back in Japan, which is low. So they eat eight times more tofu, tofu than Americans. They have a strong sense of purpose. Remember the elderly people in Nicoya? At least they have something they feel needed, right? Grandma needs to get the corn tortillas ready, right? And that's called Ikigai, and it's it alone had seven healthy years to your life. Friends, these are not seven nursing home years. These are seven healthy years. And that is the secret, let me tell you. I've been, I've been meditating on this whole longevity thing. A lot of my patients say, Doc, I don't want to live that long. I mean, look at my mom and grandma, or my grandpa. 
I don't want to be that like that for longer. The secret, friends, is you got to think, okay, the key thing to ask is, how do I want to die? That's the thing you got to ask yourself. How do I want to die? Do I want to die after having a heart attack at 50, but you survived it? See, unfortunately, you survived your heart attack. Unfortunately. Why? Because what's the cardiologist going to do when they get a hold of you? Load you up, right? So you're all loaded up. Now, uh, you're, you're not half the man you used to be now, right? So now uh, you, you're hop along, and then around 55 or 60, you get a stroke. And then a little bit later, family can't take care of you, so into the nursing home. And then you're with uh, Michelle and me for about seven to ten years, right? As dementia's coming up. Is that the way we want to die? Or do we want to die uh, like the 103-year-old uh, person that they told me about? Die in their sleep, right? That's how the Sardinians die, friends. 97-year-old uh, sh shepherd or man, <laughs> they say, uh, they were interviewing them and they said, uh, yeah, tell us about your uncle. Oh, he he uh, went out, shepherded his sheep, took his two-pound loaf of bread for the day. That's what they eat. Okay, two-pound loaf of bread, and then they pick herbs for lunch. Okay, he came home, had a wonderful dinner with their family, and didn't wake up the next morning. How much did that person cost Medicare? Mm -hmm. Zero. How, much, how many years did they languish in a nursing home? None. That's the way we want to die, right? Now, if that's the way we want to die, then the, ne the next natural question we need to answer is then how must I live to, do, to die like that? And the secret I'm going to tell you is you've got to try to live as long as you can. Why? Let me tell you, if you're, <laughs> we'll just use a stereotypical term, if you're a rocker from the 60s, right? Trash in your body, which... I have some rockers, ex-rockers, uh, as patients, and they say, Doc, if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd have, I'd have taken better care of myself, right? Um, they say, you know, man, it hurts, right? They wanted to die before they got old. There's a song, Wish I Could Die Before I Get Old, right? Uh, they want to die before 40, you know? I want to die in my glory. The problem is you're not going to die, friends. That's the problem. If you would die, it would take care of it. Because that's how we want to die, right? But the problem is you're going to survive. And then you're going to be crawling to the grave. Why do that? The idea is push off your first heart attack as far as you can so that by the time you're 80 or 90 or 100, see, when you have your heart attack at 50, you're still, you're still able to survive that somewhat. And I'll tell you, over a third of them don't even make it to the emergency room. The first symptom is death. But uh, if you make it to the emergency room, see, you're still going to have decades more to go. Whereas if you push it off to 80, that first heart attack, that's your last heart attack. You just go in your sleep. So the idea is keep yourself as healthy as possible, go as far as you can, and then have your first event then. And that's what takes it. That's how, so in order to know how do I die, how, what's the best way to die, then you ask yourself what's the best way to leave, live to get to that point. Icky guy. Social network of elders, these are called moais. They're called moais. Now, this is where in Okinawa, every small area, maybe every city block, uh, block has a, a group of elderly people. It's like what you would imagine in Mayberry, USA, right? Uh, you got people you know, elderly people, and they get together every week or so. And they share a meal, they share their joys and sorrows, right? Social network, right? Purpose? Very good. Moais. And type in life expectancy by nation. They update this uh, every year. You'll get the list, and lo and behold, Japan leads the list, right? Japan is the longest living nation in the world. Okay? Japan. Now, uh, so Okinawa is at the creme de la creme. They're the creme de la creme. They're the, high, the longest living of all the Japanese. Uh, Italy, Sardinia, is at the highest there. Now, where, where's the United States? Let's see. Oh, oh you got to go to page two here. And at the bottom of page two, you got the United States. Friends, even Cuba is doing better than us. We can't let Fidel Castro do that, friends. <laughs> He's getting ahead of us. Okay. But the Okinawans are losing their edge on longevity. Why? 
They now have the most fast food restaurants in all of Japan. Why, friends? Because when World War II ended, our boys landed on Okinawa. That was the first territory that we landed on. And we still have a base there. And we have thousands of soldiers, and we have tens of thousands of family members of those soldiers. And somebody's got to feed them. <laughs> right? So we got fast food restaurants, and now they're noticing that the Okinawans... This is not a study of the military folks, people. This is a study of the Okinawans. The Okinawans, they're now seeing a divergent population, friends. They're seeing the ones who are maintaining their traditional diet and lifestyle. They're maintaining their longevity, but there's a, another group of Okinawans. Usually the younger ones, they're looking over and saying, what are you guys eating over there? Let me try some of that. Okay? And they're not going to be living as long. They're losing their longevity. It's a shame because genetically they're, they're geared for longevity. Right? Remember, you're born with 142? They have now the highest obesity rate in all of Japan. And it's not the traditional group. It's the, the reform group or deform group. We should say. Here's examples of Japanese fast food, right? And where did they learn it from? From us. If I was a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> I would I would theorize. You know we have a you you know we have a trade deficit in America, right? We import more stuff than we export, and we're always trying to balance that. We're trying to get more exports. Okay, I would theorize it. We try we're trying to balance the trade deficit by exporting our shortening, friends, our life-shortening secrets. <laughs> our life-shortening secrets to these other nations, and is it working? Yeah. Absolutely, we're evening the playing field now, right? <laughs> we're not going to let them outlive us, yeah. right? We're going to help them live short, as short as we do. <coughs> now, uh, you all know what this, anyone know what this is? Eel, eel. that's an eel. Oh, no. Now, the eel. Yeah. Now, this is a, uh, I put this in because... The people that live long, they may not know why they live long. Okay? For example, the, the team interviewed this one 94-year-old lady, and they got, you know, did the formalities. Oh, uh, how many children do you have? How many grandchildren? Great-grandchildren? Great-great-grandchildren? And, uh, what's your favorite food? And, and ma'am, what, what do you attribute your longevity to? And she said, eat eel every day. Friends, I don't know if it's true, but I could not stomach it, even if it was true, right? <laughs> Fortunately, eel is not one of the secrets of the Blue Zones. So that just goes to show people who live long, they don't know why they live long. Uh, they just do. Now, finally, we come all full circle back to the United States, and we're landing in L.A. And if you get all out of LAX, and you get in your rental car, and you drive one hour straight east into the desert, you would be... Uh, in Loma Linda, California. Okay. Let's, the team studied the Seventh Day Adventists in Loma Linda, who are the longest living people in America. They have the highest rate of centenarians. Okay. It's on the east coast of the country, uh, west coast of the country. They, let's see what the team learned about them. First, they have a, a literal 24-hour Sabbath each Saturday. Once a week, they unplug from work and stress and plug into God and family, right? And it's a full 24 hours. It's not just a 9 to 12, 3 hour plug, or even a 11 to 12, or maybe twice a year on Easter and Christmas. It's every week for a whole 24 hour, right? Deplug from stress. Another thing they have is a large social network. All around the world, there are Seventh-day Adventists. Churches you can worship at. People you can fellowship with. Studying the same Bible, right? Uh, having the same belief system. Large social network. It's the largest Protestant educational system in the world. The largest hospital Protestant system in the world. So they have a very large social network. They also encourage a big breakfast. Even from its uh, early days, Will Kellogg, who was the brother of James Kellogg, who founded Kellogg's Corn Flakes, um, Kellogg's uh, Cereal Company. Here's a, a box of their original corn flakes and they were encouraging people to eat a good breakfast. So the people who could not, did not have time to cook their hot breakfast, cold breakfast was their option. Now, uh, do not go out of your thinking that Dr. Yim said, oh, Kellogg's cornflakes is good. No, the cornflakes you get at the store today, it's not this. This is whole grain corn. 
You'd almost break your teeth eating it. <laughs> Not really. Uh, just a bigger speech, folks. Uh, Kellogg's corn flakes uh, today is refined corn. So it's basically like eating white flour. Turns to sugar just like that. Okay? In fact, now the dietitians tell you white bread, white rice, uh, uh, refined cereals, they, you just treat it like sugar. Because it turns to sugar that quick. So try to eat whole grains more and more, more and more whole grains. Here are examples of actual Kellogg cereals that are actually whole grain. So these would be better. Uh, I normally would recommend bran flakes to my patients who are not able to cook an oatmeal. Oatmeal would be even better because oats are even healthier than the wheat is. See, but uh, this would be the same as uh, Kellogg's raisin bran. Except, see, I don't tell them they're getting the raisin bran. Because I tell them to get their own bran flakes, which are the same flakes, and then you put in your own raisins that haven't been sugared. And that's why those raisins, raisin bran is whitish because they've been sugared. So you put in your own raisins and nuts, and slice up bananas or put in blueberries, and you got a to a complete meal right there. Now their diet, as we went over this morning, gen is taken from Genesis one twenty nine. They recommend a vegetarian diet. Uh, now. One thing to note is about 30 to 35 percent of Seventh day Adventists are vegetarian. 30 to 35 percent are vegetarian. Uh, in the Korean Seventh day Adventists, it's uh, even lower. Of 5 to 10 percent are vegetarian um, of Seventh day Adventists. So don't, don't think that, uh, oh, they're all vegetarian. It's, it's not. Um, then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. And if you did not, we're not at the morning meeting, please get your hand out from the morning meeting on the uh, God's Health Plan diet sheet. It's, I believe it's in the back. Now, interesting, interestingly, the team learned that this is the only blue zone that is not losing their longevity. Hot quiz time. Don't worry, it's easy. Which of these four is Loma Linda, California? A, B, C, or I couldn't put D, I had to put F. Okay, F, right. <laughs> this right here is Loma Linda, California. And uh, friends, this is not a beautiful morning mist. <laughs> it's smog. Friends, Loma Linda is surrounded by smog. Okay. Where does that smog come from? Well, remember we landed in L.A.? L.A. is a big place. Produces a lot of waste. Takes an hour to travel what should take 10 minutes, right? And there's a Pacific breeze coming in from the west. And so it takes all that pollution. And the highway that you took to go east, it's flanked by two mountain chains. And so this smog has nowhere to go but just keep following the highway. And Loma Linda, there's a, a, it ends in a dead end of mountains, the Redland Mountains right there. So it basically is the dead end for all of the smog from L.A. So uh, we got Loma Linda, which is surrounded. It's immersed in air pollution, traffic, stress, right? They got fast food restaurants all over the place, yet they're retaining their longevity. How is that? Why? Friends, because they are maintaining faithfulness to their blue zone. It doesn't matter what blue zone you were born in or you grew up in. If you're not faithful to it, you're not going to get the benefit of it. Right? And so that's why I tell you that the real secret of the blue zones is faithfulness and loyalty to your blue zone. Also, they are the most genetically diverse blue zone. All the others, remember they were homogeneous, inbred over time. They believe almost all of them, it was because at the beginning of their history, there were a couple of people whose genetic makeup, it had the genes for long life. Uh, on the other hand, the Loma Linda Adventists, you could go to Loma Linda, and there are churches over there. They have people from all over the world. Right? They don't discriminate, oh, oh, uh, this is only for uh, Africans, or this is only for Italians, or this is only for Koreans. No. Any, they take all comers, right? Genetically diverse. So that tells you, National Geographic, friends, contrary to what some people might believe, they're not a Christian organization. That, that's who published the Blue Zone book. 
the National Geographic. They're totally atheist, friends. They don't believe in a God. Yet, Dan Buettner, who is himself an atheist, he said in the book, even though I will never become a Seventh-day Adventist, keep praying for him, friends, even though I will never become a Seventh-day Adventist, I can adopt the lifestyle that they do, and I can expect to get the same results. Why? Because they're the most genetically diverse. See, he's Dan Buettner. He's European, right? He can't go to Okinawa and say, okay, I'm in Okinawa, now I'm going to live to 100. Won't work. Because see, he's not Okinawan. But he knows that he can pick the Seventh-day Adventist Blue Zone and do what they do, and he can expect scientific to, scientifically to get the same results that they do. So, friends, which Blue Zone for me, after we've traveled around the world to the four Blue Zones, right? Costa Rica, Sardinia, Okinawa, or the Seventh-day Adventist Blue Zone. Friends, there's only one Blue Zone that anybody from any genetic background can join and benefit from, and that's the Adventist Blue Zone. At the back of the book, there are nine lessons that he summarizes, that he gathers all the data from all the Blue Zones. He says, these are the nine main points, right? Now let's look, look over those. Uh, I have these on your handout, so you don't have to write these nine down. These are nine, and I'm going to have you on your handout. They have activity. Sedentary is no good. In fact, exercise will forgive you for a lot. But let me tell you, I have patients who say, Doc, I stopped exercising, and so now I'm getting unhealthy. I'm gaining weight or this or that. I need to get back exercising. I tell them, you can never out-exercise a bad diet. Bottom line. Unless you're like one of my, uh, several of my patients who are kick, professional kickboxing instructors, they're doing six to eight hours all day long. Okay, they can. But for the vast majority of us, friends, if I told you, you got to carve out one hour every day to go do exercise, you know psychologically at the end of getting off of work, you're thinking, oh man, I have so much to do. I'm, I'll do it tomorrow. I don't have an hour to carve out, right? I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it the next day. I'll do it next week. I'll start next month. Okay, I'll wait for New Year's Day. New Year's resolution. Friends, we can never out-exercise a bad diet. Here's an example. One can of Coke, 140 calories. If you're doing a treadmill, get on a treadmill, you are burning about four calories a minute walking on a treadmill. Just walking. We're not talking fast running. Just walking. It's going to take you 35 minutes for that one can of Coke. We have people drinking two, three, four, six pack, six pack a day. Friends, there's not enough time in a day to out-exercise a bad diet. Exercise has its part. It's very important. But don't think that it's going to take the place of a, a proper diet. See? So uh, make it a part of your daily routine. Number two, harahachi boo. Boo. That's for the children. Um, that's the Okinawan idea of eat until you're 80% full. Okay? So that's easy, right? Just eat until you're 80% full. <laughs> you might say, well, Doc, how do I don't know when I'm 80% full? It's like uh, you take your car to the filling station and they say, okay, stop when you're 80% full. Well, how do I know? Okay, the easy way to know whether you, when you're 80% full is start eating, and when you're starting to eat, you're hungry, right? So uh, that's if you're eating properly, and you got to come to the third program in three weeks. Totally started, and I'm going to tell you how to eat. If you're eating small, frequent meals, you can't trust your hunger. But uh, when you're hungry, you're starting your eating, you're 0% you're zero full because you're hungry. Then when you start eating, okay, you're eating and you're getting more full, but around 50%, you're still hungry. Not as bad as when you were started, right? By the time you get to 80%, you're not hungry anymore. But you're not full. When, you're, when you feel full, you're at 100% full. Now, in America, we don't stop there, right? Because you never know when the next famine's going to be. So uh, we, we got to pack it in. Boy, you know, we got to pack it in. So we're going to go to 110% or 120%. That's when we're starting to feel, oh, I'm stuffed. We're not at 80% anymore. We're at 110 to 120%. So the key is, when you're not hungry anymore, you could stop right there. Because friends, don't worry. 
Four to five hours later, another meal is coming. We live in America. Another meal will be here in four to five hours. And most people, they burn about 80, depending on your weight, 80 to 120 calories per hour. Okay? So all you need to do is you figure, okay, five hours, 100 calories, like for me, 100 calories an hour, that's 500 calories. If I'm eating 500 calories, that's going to take me to my next pit stop. You know, you know when you're going to take a road trip to California, you don't take a pickup truck with you with huge vats of gasoline to take you to a whole trip. All you need to do is take you until your next gas fill, right? That's what you're doing. You're just going to fill up until your next gas fill. Number three, eat plants. Avoid meat and processed food. All the blue zones use lots of beans, friends. All the blue zones, right? Use lots of beans. Red grapes. Remember, the juice is just as good. And then uh, plan the vita, uh, or ikigai, remember? Some purpose. Why do you get up in the morning? What is the purpose for my life, friends? And don't you know a belief system, a religion helps with that, right? you got some purpose. Like the Seventh-day Adventist, trying to share good news to the whole world. Friends, that's a job that will never be completed, but you, it will certainly keep you busy, right? Oh, it'll be completed. It'll be completed. There you go. Man of faith. Man of faith. And number six, rest. Rest one whole day each week. And that's one of the lessons they learned from the, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Blue Zone. And don't you know, a hundred years ago, every Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian church, they recommended the whole day, friends. That's why we have blue laws. There are Sunday blue laws right now that say you cannot sell alcohol, right? Liquor by the glass. Liquor by the drink. Uh, you can't, you couldn't open stores until recently. Until we became more secularized, Sunday was a, a down day. You didn't have people on the ball field. You read these old-timey magazines, the kids weren't allowed to play with balls. On the, and this is not some of the These are Baptists and Methodists, friends. So uh, understand that this whole idea of a three-hour uh, time for God, and then the rest is whatever work we want to do, friends, that is a modern phenomenon. As far back in history as you can go, Christians, they kept Sunday the whole day. Right? The whole day. Some of you have grandparents who remember those days. Right? Uh, number seven, faith. Believe in someone or something greater than yourself. Now, many people believe in God, but uh, the Okinawans, they don't believe in a deity but they believe in their ancestors, see, their dead ancestors. So that's why we have to put something. Um, number eight, family. Put family first, share meals together. And at the Total New Start presentation, we're going to bring up uh, the benefits of eating together and also the downside of not eating together. Try. Sh surround yourself with others who do the same thing. Friends, if I can't tell a person to try to quit smoking and their whole family smokes, how long is that going to last? It's tough, right? So I try to get, when I'm doing diet counseling, I try to tell them, bring your spouse with you, right? And uh, get everybody get on the same page. Blue Zones website, they have this Venn diagram. Some of you might know what Venn diagram is. It's a statistical thing where you get commonalities, right? So, for example, you draw a circle and for Sardinia, Italy, and you put in that circle all the stuff that they do, right? that you think might give them longevity. Then you do another one for Loma Linda, then you do another one from Okinawa. And then what you do is you overlap the circles on the things that they share in common, right? So for example, like Loma Linda and Sardinia, they both share whole grains and they're culturally isolated, right? Here, Okinawa and Sardinia, they, got, they have empowered women, sunshine, and gardening. Now, the part you want to pay attention to in statistics is what's called the center here, where all of them converge. Or we might say a divine confluence. <laughs> uh, so where they all converge right here, and that's kind of blurry, so I put it on a separate s spot, and this is called a sweet spot in statistics. And this is the, these are the things you want to really focus on. Number one, family, right? Extended family, too. Uh, no smoking. A plant-based diet, constant moderate physical activity, and social engagement. And uh, did I mention beans? Okay, just checking, just checking. Okay. So friends, 
thank you for your kind attention. You've been a good audience, and I pray that you would have good health, and may your faith grow and be blessed. Now, uh, the ushers will come up and hand out uh, two hand. Uh, one handout, it has front and back, so one handout for everybody. Uh, it's got the Venn diagram on the back and the nine lessons from the Blue Zones. And then the second, uh, and then the second handout is a, a brief survey. If you would just take time, uh, just circle uh, eight or eight things or so there, just giving, us, giving me feedback. This one is for me. Give me feedback on the program today and what we could do to improve it because we want to always strive to improve, right? The relentless, relentless uh, pursuit of excellence. Yes.